Good afternoon and welcome to everyone for this fifth installment of the Community Relations Corner, our new weekly podcast uh, Zoom series. And we are discussing issues of concern to New York's Jewish community and our friends and partners uh, across the city. Uh, I'm your host, Michael Miller. I'm the Executive Vice President and CEO of the JCRC of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. And on each episode of Community Relations Corner, we'll be joined by guests representing the political, religious, economic, and diverse community leadership of New York, many of whom I've had the pleasure and honor to get to know over the course of my tenure at JCRC. And together we'll explore topics which span their interests, backgrounds, and current events impacting New York's uh, Jewish community and its neighbors, as well as our state, our city, and our nation. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsor. It happens to be a, a local Queen sponsor. Uh, the episode of Community Relations Corner is sponsored by the Free Synagogue of Flushing, serving the Reformed Jewish community in Queens, New York for over a century. Uh, visit freesynagogueflushing.org to view its magnificent stained glass sanctuary and immerse yourself in a piece of Queens Jewish history. All are invited to join for a wide array of programming and webinars and the beautiful sanctuary social hall and meditation garden are available for rental to add to your joyous occasions, your special occasions. Check out freesynagogueflushing.org to learn about Shabbat services and weekly Sunday school. Once again, visit freesynagogueflushing.org and thank you very much for sponsoring and we are honored to introduce our fifth guest on the Community Relations Corner, and that is none other than Queens District Attorney and longtime friend, uh, Melinda Katz. Uh, welcome, Melinda. Uh, I've, I've had uh, a relationship with uh, Melinda dating back to her uh, assembly days and then the city council and um, in, in Borough Hall and eventually as the borough president. Uh, and now as a district uh, uh, attorney, uh, she hasn't changed in, in, in all the years. And uh, it's, it's great, she's learned a lot and she's implemented a lot. And we hope to be talking about a lot of that. Um, but um, I, I think what we really do wanna know as we begin every one of these community relations corner sessions is more about you. Um, uh, where were you born, uh, about your celebrated uh, parents, uh, where'd you grow up, uh, schools you went to, whatever you want to tell our, our viewers and our listeners uh, to get to know who Melinda Katz is beyond being the district attorney of Queens County. Well, Rabbi Miller, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, as you know, yes, we've known each other a very long time, probably 20, 25 years. I was 10 when we met. Really. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, you know, it has been a long career and I'm very um, honored. Uh, and very privileged uh, to be here today with the JCRC, an organization I've learned to really, uh, you know, trust uh, in the work that you do and the constituents that you help. Uh, and thank you for all that you do, Rabbi Miller. Every time we have an event in Queens that's important, either it's about the Intifada years ago or about feeding people or about commemorating and remembering uh, the Holocaust, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you, you are always uh, there for me. In fact, for a while there, I was wondering if you were running for Queensborough president <laughs> uh, because you're in Queens so much and we appreciate that. Uh, you know, look, I am a Queens kid through and through. I was born 55 years ago. I say that proudly. Uh, I live in the house that I was brought up in. My parents bought a house in Forest Hills uh, in, uh, in the area, the, the, the more inexpensive area of Forest Hills um, in 1953. Uh, I have lived there ever since, except for the four years that I was at University of Massachusetts. Mm. Uh, I was raised there. My three brothers were raised there. I went to public schools. I went to 144 Sage Hillcrest High School. Then I went to the University of Massachusetts. Uh, and then I went to St. John's uh, Law School. Uh, I am raising my two children, as you know, Carter and Hunter, uh, in that very same house. They live in the bedroom that I was brought up in, which is really, <laughs> it's really a trip, right? When you walk into the same bedroom, uh, that you used to live in. They tell me off from the same bench in the same bedroom that you used to do with your father. Uh, very different reaction now from parents than it was back then. Um, but you know, it's, it's a blessing uh, to be able to raise them in the same house. They go to the same elementary school I did. Uh, and so I went to law school to save the world. Uh, I went to law school to save the world and then realized I had a lot of bills. 
uh, <laughs> when I came out of law school. So uh, I ended up working at a private law firm, Mergers and Acquisitions, on associate there for five years, uh, while Gottschall and Manjis was the second largest law firm in the city of New York when I actually took that job. Wow. And you know, while I was in law school, I interned for Michael Mukasey, who was a Southern District Court, who ended up being the United States Attorney General uh, and maintained a good relationship with him. I interned for the U.S. Attorney's Office for Legal Aid. Uh, and you know, look, I ended up uh, running for the New York State Assembly in 1994. So I ran why, against the party, by the way. Why, why did you decide to go into politics? You know, my father was the founder and director of the Queen's Symphony Orchestra. Yep. Uh, my mother was the founder of the Queen's Council on the Arts. Um, they were both involved with our schools. They were both involved in the community. You know, my father used to drive to his concerts every day at Queens College, and he used to stop by the bus stop, and he used to talk to everyone who was waiting to go to the concerts, and he would fill up the car as much as he could, and then he would listen to what was going on in the community uh, after that uh, in the car, and it gave him an opportunity, you know, to hear what was happening in the neighborhood. Um, and look, I was at Wild Gotchel. I was making a very good living. And I realized as I was helping in campaigns that I was much more interested in what was going on in the senior community and what was going on in the neighborhood. Uh, my father and mother were both gone. Uh, and it gave me the opportunity of like, of really becoming family and being part of the community. Um, and so I ran for the New York State Assembly uh, in order to have uh, what I thought was a great career in helping people. Uh, I won the assembly race. Then I went to the New York City, uh, then I went to, uh, uh, ran for Congress, as you know. Yeah. Life would have been different, I guess, for everyone had I won that race. That's, that is correct, because uh, there was you know, somebody who's no longer in politics. That's right. <laughs> so it was uh, me and uh, Anthony ran against each other for Congress. He won by 380 votes, not that it bothered me at all. Um, but I, you know, I, never, I still haven't regretted the fact that I called you Congresswoman before the election, and I, I guess I was wrong, but. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, people, you know, people have called me a lot worse. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but we are, you know, we, we ran against each other. I ended up working for the great borough president, Claire Shulman. Uh, and she was a great mentor and a great leader to me. She taught me so much about running a meeting, about how to get what you need out of the different agencies to deliver the services that you need, about how to run a meeting at a time, you know, 20, 25 years ago, we talk about this like it's second nature now, but 20, 25 years ago, a woman in charge I mean, you know, the Geraldine Ferraros of the world were around, the Bella Abzugs of the world were around, but you right. know, it was still a, a hole. Um, and she really taught me how to take control of it, get what you need from people to service her constituents and her community. Uh, and uh, I took a lot of those lessons to heart. And then I went to the land use committee, the city council, I was the chair, you know, second, second or first most powerful committee in the New York city council. Um, you know, the last thing we approved was the museum of modern art going up, you know, right. 100 stories or whatever it went up. Uh, and we negotiated the Williamsburg Greenpoint. Remember, that was my land use application. Uh, we were negotiating that till the wee hours of every morning uh, for at least a month. And people forget that, you know, it was me and Dr. Roth, Mr. Dr. Roth sitting across from each other, uh, figuring out where that was going to lead. Um, so look, I am very, um, I'm very lucky. Um, and I feel very privileged to have known so many people. It's now about uh, 25 years later or 28 years later, uh, and I'm sitting in the district attorney's office. While I was borough president, I got to work with a lot of different communities. I got to work with crisis management groups. I got to work with the Jewish groups, with the Asian groups, with the South Asian. Um, and as the world changed over the last several years to bring criminal justice reform to the forefront, while I believe still making sure that our borough is safe, and I would argue that the more kids you help, the more kids you get in mentorship programs, the more workforce development, all of that that comes with it, education, uh, makes the borough safer. But I am a district attorney who will prosecute drivers of violence. I will prosecute those that are carrying guns and shooting guns off uh, and assaulting people and hate crimes. And that's a balance I, I hope that we've achieved. Yeah, well, I Thank you very much. Uh, your, your, your background is fascinating. Um, I, I'm just wondering about the, the, whether there's actually a quantum leap uh, between being um, a legislator uh, to being uh, an executive, which is what a borough president is, uh, to being a, a prosecutor. And some of our, our listeners and viewers uh, may not understand what the job of DA entails. 
uh, but it certainly is different than the positions you, you've, you've held before. Um, was it a significant transition for you? It, was it a, a, a natural a segue from one to the other? So as you know, when I was um, discussing running for district attorney, uh, there was this issue that I was never a career prosecutor. I would argue that I wasn't responsible for a lot of things that were wrong in the system then uh, because I was not a career prosecutor. I will tell you that when I was running for district attorney, the idea that that was the least important thing, I mean, never could be greater than it is now. Uh, I became the DA after running uh, the borough president's office, which remember, 65 staff members, 700 community board appointments, a $6 million, $5.4 million budget. All of this I ran. So when I became the DA, it was a very different world than it is now. I mean, on January 1st, all the bail laws in the city of New York and the state of New York changed. It's now changed again, right. twice now. Discovery laws changed twice. Uh, we got rid of onerous, I thought, uh, policies here at the DA's office on day one. We have gone by 700 employees, 700 employees have gone 100% virtual since, um, since COVID started on March 15th. We now are coming back. And so now we have to deal with that. And at the same time, there's a national discussion and unrest on how policing occurs in the United States of America. So yes, I think that you know, what a DA's requirements are, I think you need to be a very good lawyer. I need, think you need to have a balance of constitutional law and a balance of really just being able to apply what you know as a good lawyer. Um, and I also think that being a career pro being a prosecutor depends on what your definition of justice is. Right? Justice, you know, some folks would say being a prosecutor is 100% how many convictions you get. That's not me. My version of justice is doing the right thing every time. And, you know, if you can balance the fact that I don't prosecute for curfews when they had curfews or social distancing or low levels of marijuana. But I will prosecute you if you shoot, if you have a gun, if you're dealing heavy uh, amounts of, of, of narcotics, uh, because those are drivers of crime. But at the same time, I want to make sure the next generation doesn't pick that gun up and use it also. So I think that it was a leap um, from being a borough president, except for the fact that community relations have become one of the most important things, especially during this COVID time. And, you know, last but not least, the experience I had in running a council office, an assembly office, and a borough president's office was key when COVID came. You know, you hire people not for the best of circumstances, you hire them for the worst of circumstances. Yes. And the truth is that I'm glad that I had the opportunity to make sure this office still ran during COVID. But, you know, because I've ran so many offices, I'll give you an example. When the grand jurors stopped showing up at the end of February, I said to my folks, we need to prepare because the grand juries might shut down. And so we ordered hundreds of computers for people to work at home. We made sure that we had arraignments on site because in case anything happens with technology, you need to be able to do those arraignments within 24 hours. We made sure that all the intake was gonna be covered even if people started you know, bagging out and not be able to come in. So I think that my experience was really, you know, I hate to say meant to be, but you know, the fact that I was able to run such a you know, 700 person office during that time, you know, I'm glad we're through it. Let me put it that way. Great. No, I, I appreciate that. But you mentioned before uh, criminal justice reform, um, which takes on even uh, greater uh, importance during the course of this pan pandemic. Um, uh, what are the issues that you see in the forefront of the criminal justice reform uh, movement? It even came up last night in, in the vice presidential uh, debate brought up by the vice president, by Vice President Pence. Um, uh, we here at JCRC have created a Jewish co uh, uh, coalition uh, on criminal justice uh, reform. Um, and just, I, I think we would all learn a lot from what is happening uh, in, in the Queens DA's office um, uh, with regard to where criminal justice reform is headed um, and uh, mistakes that may have been made in, in the past, as I think you referenced as well, uh, potentially can be, can be corrected. Uh, this is like a, a new arena for us, uh, for the country, uh, let alone here in, in New York. 
and most especially as well beyond just COVID, but also the outbreak of gun violence uh, that we haven't seen in New York in years. You know, I think it matters on how you define, uh, you know, criminal justice, right? I, I believe that you can have fairness in a system and equitable, equitable, uh, an equitable system while still keeping the borough safe. And I think that's really important. You know, the, bail, the reason the bail laws happened and the new, you know, reforms of the bail laws is because for so long, it was one-sided. For so long, it affected communities of color uh, to a much larger extent than any other community. And we were holding people for, you know, $1,000 in bail. People were being held on misdemeanor charges. They were going to show up in court. They were not going to fly away. And yet they were being held on such small amounts of bail. And, you know, so the new laws got rid of a bail requirement. You couldn't, you couldn't even give bail. Uh, there are no qualifying offenses for misdemeanors. And for nonviolent felonies as well. Now, as you know, New York doesn't do the uh, dangerousness. Uh, there are many of us that would disagree that, that maybe it should. Um, but at the end of the day now, you can only get bail on, on really violent felonies, uh, things that you, you're worried that someone's not going to show up because the time that they might serve uh, is so great. But, you know, at the end of the day, if someone should be in because they might fly, a million dollars is not going to matter either way. Either they should be in or they shouldn't be in. It shouldn't matter how much they can pay. So I think that I, you know, I think that that's a fairness issue that's extremely important. You can't have people being held simply because they're too poor to pay bail, which is why now we're supposed to take into account how much someone can pay. And, you know, it's worked out pretty well. I know the press likes to sometimes say, oh, all these folks are committing uh, more crimes that are out on misdemeanors. But at the end of the day, the unfairness of the way it previously worked was so drastic that I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, and in Queens County, look, we're very serious. We've not deferred one prosecution because of COVID. Uh, and I think that's very important. You know, if you get caught with a gun here in Queens County, you know, we are not deferring that prosecution. And, you know, look, sometimes we also don't have the traffic that, uh, you know, other places have. So I think that it, it evens out at the end of the day. And do you see any correlation between criminal justice reform and gun violence? Um, there was a rally uh, in, in Queens just a couple of months ago, if I remember correctly, just on, on that, that issue. It's not just in one particular borough, it's, it's across the boroughs. Um, and that's also come up in, in the press, um, that the, the, the laws have, have become uh, too loose and uh, more people are getting out on the street and people are not worried uh, about being arrested uh, because they're going to be let out of jail anyway. Well, right. So if you look at what's happening since the gun laws changed, since the bail laws changed, it's not really a fair assessment, right? So right now you can go up to anyone on the street and shoot them. You have a mask on, which everybody has a mask on. So ID is very hard. If someone approaches a group of people with a mask on, nobody thinks twice of it right now. And that's all because of COVID. The witnesses on the street are much less because people are quarantining. So you have the, I, I hate to use the term perfect storm because I think it's been thrown around a little too much. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you have a, a, a shooter who can't be identified. You have no witnesses in the street because people aren't really hanging out a lot on the street these days unless they have to. You have a group of people who aren't gonna think twice about someone, come, someone coming up to them with a mask on. And you have the fact that with, with COVID, I think people haven't wanted uh, to hold people you know, on high bails. Um, and so I think, you know, this all comes together. Um, so whether or not it's the bail laws or the co or COVID, because remember, it's only been since March 15th that the shootings have gone up in New York City. Right. Um, I, I'm not sure we can actually assess it fairly. And, and in terms of NYPD, is that something you want to weigh in on? Uh, I mean, there's this movement to defund the, the police. Uh, wh where is the Queens DA on that? I think that, you know, if, we, if we're talking about education and the need to make sure that we police in a different way, I think that's not whether you defund them or not. It's still 38,000 police officers, or 36, 36 to 38,000, that are going to be uh, trained, that are going to be on the streets, who put themselves in harm's way every day. 
uh, and who are going to be called upon and called on any activity that they do. You know, I happen to be the first uh, district attorney to hold a police officer accountable uh, for the Eric Garner strangulation law. Uh, you know, the ink wasn't even dry on Andrew Cuomo's signature when uh, allegedly um, a police officer, you know, uh, committed the chokehold in Far Rockaway. Right. And, you know, I had to make a determination because it's, you know, within the discretion as to whether or not the counts were made. Uh, at the end of the day, it was an attempted of the Eric Garner law uh, that we charged him with. And, you know, I'm of the belief, quite honestly, Rabbi Miller, that, you know, if you hold police accountable, it actually helps keep public safe because then communities feel more comfortable confiding in police officers and then we can find more uh, defendants and we can get more witnesses to talk to us should we, um, should we uh, uh, arrest them. Uh, and to be able to find defendants. So, look, it's never an easy answer. Uh, it's a balance. Okay. Uh, well, on, on that note, as we're trying to balance a lot of things in this uh, program, uh, I'm going to throw in a, another opportunity to, to thank our, our sponsor, um, that this episode of Community Relations Corner with District Attorney Melinda Katz is sponsored by the Free Synagogue of, of Flushing in her backyard, more or less. Uh, serving the Reformed Jewish community in, in Queens, New York uh, for over a century, even though she's a member of the Forest Hills Jewish Center. Uh, visit uh, freesynagogueflushing.org to view its magnificent stained glass sanctuary and immerse yourself in a piece of Queens Jewish history. All are invited to join for a wide array of programming and webinars and the beautiful sanctuary social hall and meditation garden are available for rental to add to your joyous occasions. Check out freesynagogueflushing.org to learn about Shabbat and uh, holiday services this coming weekend um, and weekly Sunday school. Once again, please visit freesynagogueflushing.org and that get to something um, more related to the Jewish community and that's anti-Semitism. Um, it, it, luckily, uh, Queens has not seen the same level of, of incidents as uh, some other boroughs have, but certainly before COVID hit, uh, there was a, a documented spike. Um, it wasn't just an uptick. It was a, a spike, most like a spasm of, of anti-Semitic incidents in the New York metropolitan area, um, culminating outside of New York in Jersey City and, and up in, in Muncie uh, with uh, horrible tragedies and murders. But um, here in New York, uh, just uh, too many. And uh, the question is, what role does um, the DA's office in Queens have uh, in uh, seeking to prevent anti-Semitism. And when you do have cases of anti-Semitism or any other hate crime for that matter, how are they investigated and prosecuted, uh, particularly in order to ward off any uh, additional acts of hate? Uh, you know, look, we, we've been through a lot of uh, anti-Semitic uh, rallies, you know, uh, against anti-Semitism together. Uh, as you know, I've been very outspoken uh, in, in that cause. Uh, and as the DA, that certainly hasn't changed. Uh, I actually, the first few months I was here, uh, created a hate crimes bureau in and of itself. It used to be attached to another bureau. Uh, I appointed Michael Brobner, who is the chief of the bureau, uh, to investigate all hate crimes and to prosecute them in the borough of Queens County. Uh, Anti-Semitic acts, yes, there was a spike in the very beginning before COVID. Now it seems to be more, a little more about property damage uh, and, and you know, anti-Semitic slurs. Uh, and we investigate all of them. Uh, the way something becomes a hate crime though, and this is sort of misunderstood a lot of times, it's, it's, it can't be a personal thing about what someone does. So hate crimes are normally judged on the fact that you, know, you are singled out because of your race, religion, uh, who you love, uh, things of that nature. But uh, it, it has to be, you know, centered around that. Uh, and I think we are very serious about prosecuting those who pick out folks simply because of their religion or, or, or anything else that's a protected class. Uh, Anti-Semitism is clearly no ex exception. Um, and, you know, but it takes a lot of investigation and it takes also the facts of the case. Was someone picked out because they were wearing tzitzis or because they were wearing a yarmulke or any type of kippah? Or were they pointed, you know, pointed out because of a hijab they were wearing or because they were kissing a man, you know, uh, uh, LGBT, uh, things like that. Um, and so we're very careful in our investigations. I have no problem prosecuting. 
uh, when it is a hate crime and raising the level to a hate crime in the aggravating sense. Um, and so, you know, look, we are very involved in that. And I think it's also important to note that, you know, we talked a little bit about how I ended up in the DA's office, right? I do think it's important when you're prosecuting hate crimes to have the faith of a community. They feel, you know, people feel comfortable coming to you because they know you're going to take them seriously. People feel that you will represent their interests in the right way. Uh, and I think that has been priceless here for me not only in the Jewish community, but in the Muslim community and in the other communities that are, and in the Chinese community when it comes to COVID. Um, I think that there is that faith that you need in order to truly properly get to the hate crimes and the source of it. Yeah, uh, hate crimes um, are misunderstood under many circumstances as to what is and what isn't and, and what needs to be done in order for a prosecution uh, to be launched. Uh, but there's another area uh, that I want to explore with you, and that's uh, anti-Israel hate. Um, and like where the line is uh, when uh, anti-Israel sentiments are expressed. So you're a, a very, very strong uh, supporter uh, of Israel and of, uh, certainly as borough president sponsored innumerable uh, events, including Jerusalem Day events that I had the honor of, of uh, participating, participating together with you. You've traveled to Israel uh, with, with, with us and only because of childcare, I know. Uh, we were not able to, to get you to come with us when you were borough president um, and hopefully uh, in, in your current uh, position, uh, which is not uh, term limited, <laughs> uh, we, we hope to be able to, to have My you join us. My kids are getting us. older. <laughs> My kids are getting older. It's okay. But, uh, back, back to the, the, the direct question uh, pertaining to hate crimes when it comes to um, uh, anti-Israel activity. Um, have, have you thought that through? Well, yeah. So, so people have a First Amendment right to comment on how they want to comment. Um, they, can't, they can't comment on a synagogue. They can't uh, use graffiti to comment on it. Uh, they can't attack people because of their views. But there is a First Amendment right, which I encourage, by the way, in all walks, um, to be able to utilize to express opinions. I think that on a personal level, more so, I've commented on different, what I thought was anti-Semitic uh, comments. You know, we had this, this, this uh, form that people asked someone to sign in a campaign that said, you know, I will never visit Israel, I think it was, or something like that. And as you know, I commented very strongly uh, on my social media platform, but that doesn't make it prosecutable, right? And I think that that's a big distinction. Um, you write an anti-Semitic remark on a synagogue, that's a different, that's a different crime. Um, and so I think that there's always the line. I think there's always this balance between First Amendment and things to prosecute on. And I think you have to be careful. Yeah. You know, we also don't want to be, uh, you know, taking what people are saying uh, and, and when they have a right to say it um, and, and utilizing that in a bad way. You know, I'll give you an example, the protests, right? So during the George Floyd, um, you know, well, not during, we're still in it. But, you know, when, when protests started happening, you know, I would say very loud and clear, I am not prosecuting for social distance or curfew, but I'm not going to say I'm not prosecuting for protests because that's your First Amendment right. And that's not a discretionary thing. That's a First Amendment right. So I think that on my personal media, I've been very outspoken. Uh, and as the DA, we look very closely at prosecutable offenses. Yeah. So um, in terms of, of, we talked before about community relations, um, what role can uh, our viewers um, play in being of value to you? Um, let alone organizations such as um, JCRC or the, the Queens Jewish Community Council, or QJCC. Um, it's different, again, when you're a, a borough president or, or a legislator in, in the council or in the assembly. Uh, is there a role for community uh, to participate together with the district attorney? Of course. So first of all, we're going to have our Jewish advisory board uh, start up again here at the Queens DA's office. We encourage anybody that would like to be part of that. Uh, to let me know. Uh, I think we're going to start doing that next month, if not the month after, I guess next month. Uh, and we got a little bit waylaid because of COVID, uh, but we're starting up again. Uh, that's number one. Number two, we've been very involved in some of the food giveaways, right? So we can get you know, things like we could do the same thing as sort of other electives. We can get sanitizer, we could get masks, you know, so we've been very involved in that. 
Uh, you know, number three, I think it's important for the community to know that I'm still here. I went down the block, right? And so the same uh, opinions I had before, the same verb uh, that I bring, you know, to our causes, uh, the same uh, outspokenness that I had before, I still have. So if there's things happening in the community that we think I should know, I urge you guys, you know, everyone who's listening, but others as well, to call it in. If you think there's anti-Semitic activity happening, I'd like to know. If you have events where you'd like me to talk about hate crimes, or you'd like me to talk about um, programs that are available, uh, I'd like to know. Um, if you have uh, town hall meetings about, you know, the rise and spike of certain types of criminal activity. I mean, we had everything, you know, affects the Jewish community. We had a few years ago in, in Cord Meyer, you know, uh, houses that were being burned down who were under construction uh, in that community there. Uh, and, you know, we had meetings with the community. I could still do that as district attorney. Uh, yes, it's a different role, but I haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> well, I, I think um, I, I was asked to join your uh, your community advisory board, and yeah, and I'm 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 really thrilled to be a part of it when it revs up uh, uh, again. Um, I I, I want to end uh, because of the limitations on time. I want to end uh, talking about uh, two very very important women. One of whom you spoke about before. Both of whom have passed away. Uh, let's first talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, what role did Justice Ginsburg play, if at all, uh, in your thinking uh, within the, uh, the role that you're currently playing uh, politically um, and uh, the politicization of, of the judicial system uh, over the past number of decades? It's, it's not just now, it's been a uh, reality for a while. Uh, does, does, has that affected uh, American attitudes toward towards the, the federal ju judiciary. Uh, but most importantly is, is Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Melinda Katz, both uh, Jewish women, uh, one from Brooklyn originally and, and one from Queens. You know, it's funny because after she died, I, I, I knew her as a jurist and as a lawyer, you know, you, you follow the Supreme Court uh, members uh, just because you're in the same business and, and you're interested in how they vote and the, what they bring to the Supreme Court. I will tell you that this woman, if you look at her history, it was amazing at a time when women sometimes didn't get to be amazing. Uh, you know, and I, I always say the example of Sandra Day O'Connor, you know, when she graduated uh, third in her class and Rehnquist graduated one, you know, she could only get a job as a legal secretary when she graduated uh, law school, uh, even though she graduated third. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg seemed to have bring a touch, you know, seemed to have brought a touch of class to the Supreme Court when yeah. she was appointed, right? She was straightforward, she shot from the hip, she wasn't shy. She was working out in the gym, letting people take pictures of her while she was doing it, you know, at the age of whatever, 75. Uh, you know, she had a lot of, a lot of guts. And, and I think that at a time when, when women, uh, you know, sometimes didn't get to show that. Um, you know, if you look back at her history uh, and, and, and the lives that she affected and, and the spunk in which she did it with, uh, you, you know, there's, there's those women who just lead the way. You know, I wouldn't be the DA if it were not for women like her, if it were not for women like Geraldine Ferraro, if it were not for women like Shirley Chisholm, you know, if it were not for like these strong uh, women who just said, look, I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm, I'm good at it and, you know, deal with it. <laughs> and I think that uh, Judge Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg was really great at sending that message. Uh, she's a loss. Um, she's become an icon. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, she, she changed lives and she also changed what people view as a Supreme Court justice and what they can be, that they were human and that they had worlds and lives of their own. Uh, so I think it was a great loss, uh, you know, whether it happened today or whether it happened in January, it was a great loss. I, I, I had great respect for her uh, of course, as a jurist, uh, but when I heard that her grandchildren called her Bubby, yep. <laughs> that's right. That, that really struck home. Um, it and, it and, also shows that generation, by the way. Right. It shows, I mean, in the secular sort of, you know, Jewish world, I mean, I called my grandmother, grandfather, Bubby and Zadie, right? But I noticed today it's not that prevalent, you know, in, except in, in certain communities. But, you know, right. uh, I think that 
the fact that she was called Bubby, right, shows the generation she comes from. Right. Uh, and uh, well, uh, she'll be missed. Yeah, uh, one other great woman whom you referenced uh, at, at the top of the show, uh, and that's Claire Shulman, uh, who died at age 94 just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I had the, uh, the privilege of being asked to be the, the uh, officiating rabbi at, at her funeral and spoke about all the, I actually did a lot of research and spoke about all of the amazing things that, that she was able to uh, accomplish. So what, what was it like uh, for, for you as a, um, a, a young uh, political figure uh, working in a borough led by a, a very strong woman um, a woman highly confident and highly competent. Um, uh, did, did she have any particular influence o over uh, you and your accomplishments over the years? So one of the lessons as a young woman that Claire taught me was that you can shine through other people. So, you know, it's funny in, in, in elected office, a lot of uh, elected officials aren't that anxious, not because of any other reason, except that it's sometimes difficult to hire former elected officials, right? You hire a former elected official and you're an elected, you know, you sometimes wonder how that dynamic works. Claire hired me after I lost a very large congressional race uh, against Anthony. Uh, I had been, you know, several years as a New York State Assembly member and she hired me anyway and said, you know what? You're really good at speaking in public you have that, you know, same sort of gumsha that I have, right? And she was very like, you know, go do it. Uh, she never worried that I was also an elected official. She never worried that I'd outshine in any way, not that I could outshine Claire Shulman, but she never worried about it. She was uh, extremely, um, you know, she, she promoted me, gave me the confidence. Uh, and, and, you know, I was fine with the fact that I would do things. And she said, yeah, she works for me. <laughs> so I hired her. I was smart enough. And, you know, it, it taught me that, um, you know, sometimes the way to really shine is to say nothing. Um, because Claire didn't have to. All she had to do was look at you the wrong way. Uh, and, and you knew that you were going to do whatever she wanted you to do. Uh, and it wasn't a hard sort of choice. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. When, when uh, she was trying to build the Astoria pool, uh, and, and, you know, I was working for her at that time and it was her birthday and Rudy Giuliani came in for a town hall meeting. And so Rudy brings her a cake uh, to sing happy birthday with the staff, you know, backstage. And so Rudy said, make a wish and blow out the candle. So Claire said, I want $9 million for my pool. <laughs> <laughs> and she blew out the candle. And you know, he asked. So, you know, he shouldn't have asked if he didn't want an answer. So, you know, she taught me a lot about um, how to get things done without, you know, like in, in a way that made people want to do them. Um, at the end of the day, you can't change people's minds, but it's that soft confidence. I don't think I could ever repeat it like she had it, but she had it at a time, you know, she came into office at a very difficult time. She replaced Donald Mattis in the eighties. She was the first female for a president. She really had to shatter the glass ceiling. She came under this, you know, onerous, sort of, you know, atmosphere at the time. Uh, and, and she made it happen. She also trained a lot of people. I became an elected official. Barry Gredenchik became an elected official. Jeff Aubrey uh, right. became an elected official. Uh, you know, uh, Nick Garifas became yeah. uh, right. an amazing because. Southern District or Eastern District Court judge. Mm. Uh, so a lot of great people came out of there. And yeah. me. <laughs> and you. And you. Very much of a great person. And I can't thank you uh, enough, District Attorney, and dear friend, uh, Melinda Katz, for, for being a guest on our Community Relations Corner. It, it's really been such a pleasure speaking with you as it, as it always is and always uh, will be. Um, thank you so much for spending uh, time uh, with us. And before we close and give you a last word, uh, let me get one more time thank our, our sponsor, uh, the Queens-based uh, uh, Flushing Free Synagogue, uh, the Free Synagogue of Flushing, serving the Reformed Jewish community in Queens, New York for over a century. Visit the, the Free Synagogue, Flushing.org, to view its magnificent stained glass sanctuary and immerse yourself in a piece of Queens Jewish history. All are invited to join for a wide array of programming and webinars, and the beautiful sanctuary, social hall, and meditation garden are available for rental to add to your joyous occasions. 
Check out freesynagogueflushing.org to learn more about Shabbat and holiday services this weekend and uh, weekly Sunday school. Once again, please visit freesynagogueflushing.org. Last word to the DA. Yeah, I feel a little left out. I'd like to thank the Free Synagogue of Flushing <laughs> Town. Uh, you know, I, they, they are an amazing organization and they stood the test of time. Uh, so thank you to the Free Synagogue. Rabbi Miller, thank you for all the work that you do, all the work that JCRC does for all communities throughout the city, not just the Jewish community, but for really every community that needs your help. You are there, you are steadfast, you are there for support in good times and in bad times. And we've lived through a lot together, I feel like. Um, but we're gonna get, you know, get out the other side of all this. You know, COVID has really changed so many people's lives. Uh, and I think it's gonna be one of those things in 10 or 15 years when we talk about it, right? Remember what happened when? Um, and we're gonna be judged a lot by how we acted during this time. Uh, your organization has delivered food and, and so many services to so many. Uh, you can never be thanked enough for the work that you have done. So thank you, good Yantif to everyone on the call. I know it's a different type of Yantif this year, <laughs> um, but really good Yantif and we should all be happy and safe. Thank, thank you. you. And healthy, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And our thanks again to Free Synagogues, President Ed Chowder, a uh, member of our board. Hi, and Cantor, Cantor Alan Brava. Um, and to JCRC staff and, and our board, our president, Cheryl Fishbein, uh, and wishing everybody uh, not only a good yantif, but a chag sameach. <laughs> um, enjoy the balance of, of Sukkot. Uh, and whenever it is that you watch this, this is going to be uh, on our Facebook uh, and, and elsewhere on YouTube and who knows wherever else, various platforms uh, for a very, very long time, if not forever. Um, I hope that you have an opportunity to really listen to what the DA had to say um, and the impact that she has been making for many, many years on her uh, supporting and serving her constituents and now serving the entire borough as district attorney. Uh, shalom to everybody. Be well, stay well, and look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Community Relations Corner. Bye-bye. Shalom. Good yantif. <laughs>